So in this deep dive of the Dribble Force, I wanted to see how far back I could trace the origins of it, and let me just say right now, it was not an easy task. Just to be clear, what I'm referring to as the Dribble Force is the one we all use when you hold a break at the back of the deck in Biddle Grip, and you dribble the deck into your other hand, somebody says stop, and that card is forced. Okay, so according to sources on the Conjuring Credits website, the idea of dribbling cards or dropping cards into your hand or on the table uh, and stopping at a particular location of the deck, uh, whether it be a known card or a chosen card, came before the idea of using it as a force. It also says that dating the idea of using it as a force has yet to be ascertained. The earliest known recording we have of this technique or this idea dates back to 1700 in the anonymous Asti manuscript. Now there were two handlings described in there. Uh, one used a sort of an angled card and the other used a form of a break. So what's being described there is taking the pack lengthwise like this, so not like this, but you're like this instead, and the form of break uh, that they're talking about there is this, uh, using your fingers to hold uh, two packets separately. So you would break it uh, on this side, and uh, the card right here would be the known card, okay? So either somebody picks it or you want somebody to look at it. Either way, it's not very clear in that um, in that script there. So what they're saying to do is hold the upper packet with your middle finger and the lower packet with your uh, ring finger or your third or th third finger there, right? So now it says to release uh, your ring finger there and hold the packet firmly, the upper packet firmly with your middle and thumb. So when you release it, uh, those cards drop. Now. It's not clear whether or not they're saying to just drop the whole packet or do a dribble type action, right? Do something like that and make it appear there, right? Um, so I don't know whether or not it's actually a dribble action or doing that. Either way, uh, it's kind of interesting that the first uh, ever in print use of dropping cards to have somebody know a card or look at a card uh, was doing it that way in that, that long ago. So just to increase my odds of finding this dribble force and where it came from, I was taking a look at all of the sort of stop forces you would do in your hands, and one force that came to mind is of course the riffle force or the ruffle force. Now it's believed that the riffle force was created by a guy named Philip Breslau, which was described in an unpublished notebook dated 1800. The anonymous author of this notebook makes it clear that he didn't really know how Breslau was doing this force. Um, he said he could have been holding a break, he, he said he could have been using a long card or a wide card or a short card. These things, these sort of gaff cards, were very popular in that era. So the riffle force that's being described there is not the usual one that we all do today uh, with your thumb like this. Instead, it's a ruffling action at the front of the deck with your fingers, right, like this. And somebody would say stop at the, at the long card or the break. And if you're holding a break, it says to uh, have somebody say stop and lift the upper packet. So it's sort of like the same thing as a riffle force, right? You hold a break, somebody says stop, you just actually lift the cards from the break or at the gaffed card, right? But in this case, um, it's not clear whether or not Breslau was using a break or a thick card, but I like to believe uh, that he was using, uh, using a break uh, because this is a good force to use, right? Somebody says stop, boom. It's, uh, I think it's pretty good. Now, the reason why I bring all this up, this riffle for us up, is because later on in the book, uh, he says, he it's an odd phrase, he says, um, by raising and dropping the cards, you can do the same force. And it sounds like that might be a dribble type action, right? S saying raising and dropping the cards, right? So it could be he was holding a break like this, and then maybe raising and dropping cards to the break. I don't know. I don't know how he must have done it, but I think that phrase, uh, raising and dropping cards, might be referring to a dribble. 
So fast forward a few years to the year 1859, a sort of, I guess, prototype or an ancestor of the Drupal Force was described by a French magician by the name of Jean-Nicolas Poncin in this book uh, right here. I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but uh, under the title, uh, I'll just play my Google here. It literally translates to make the card appear with the word stop. So in this procedure or this technique, a gaffed card again is used um, in, in the middle of the deck, whether it be a long card or a wide card, short card, thick card. And it's kind of interesting that all of these sort of gaff cards were used that long ago. I think it's very interesting. But anyway, that gaff card would be in the middle of the deck. And what you would do is that would be either above or, or below uh, a selection, right, that somebody picked. And it would go back in the middle of the deck right by that gaff card. So what they would do is this. They would sort of drop cards a few at a time, sort of like a dribble packets like this all over the table and somebody would say stop and as soon as they do right the last packet dropped would be their card so thankfully everything or most everything in that french uh volume was translated and republished in modern magic by professor hoffman in 1876 then later on in 1936, uh, it was explained again in the Encyclopedia of Card Tricks. However, this time it's using a gaff deck that we all know called the Stripper Deck. So as you can see so far, um, none of these techniques or ideas is really the dribble force that we all know and use today. At least not in the hands like this, right? So to get to the bottom of the dribble force, we first have to take a look at the dribble itself. Where did the dribble come from? When did people start doing this? Well, <laughs> you know, it's never, I don't think it's in print, but it's, it's my opinion that since cards were first made, people probably did this action here, right? Dribbling cards or just playing with cards like this nonchalantly, like, it, like it's a habit, right? The earliest that I could find in print that mentions sort of dropping cards like this into your hand, at least for a tricky purpose, was in a book called More Card Manipulations uh, by Jean Hugard in 1938. So here's the action on that. So a card would be, you know, put into the deck and angled or side jogged, uh, hidden underneath your hand, right? Like this. And to hide that, what is being described there is uh, hold the deck a few, you know, two inches or so above your hand and spring them flat right onto your hand like this, which in my opinion is describing a dribble, right? So if you do that, um, you can maintain that jog, right? Springing them flat into your hand an inch or so above your hand like this. And then that, of course, hides that jog, but anytime you need it, again, you can just get it right there, right? So I think that's a very good technique as well, and it's kind of cool to see a dribble being <laughs> mentioned so long ago. A few years after that, a, another uh, sort of tricky purpose for dropping or dribbling cards into your hand was found in Expert Card Technique in 1940 under the title The Drop Control. This is kind of interesting. Uh, this is the action on it. So what's being described here is a kind of a neat card control, kind of impractical, but that's beside the point. Um, so what you would do is you would uh, get a break somewhere in the middle of the deck uh, with, your, with your pinky, and then you would sort of spring off a riffle off some cards let's just do four in this case onto your onto the tip of your uh, little finger there so you go one two three four five right maybe five and then you have to hold a break like this with your ring finger and your so you're holding two breaks right there right so somebody has chosen a card and it says to start dropping small packets into your hand at, you know, a few at a time. So in the action of doing sort of a dribble, right? So dropping packets a few at a time and you ask somebody to put their card back. And as soon as you say that, you can drop all the cards um, below the first break, right? So they put their card there, the 10 of diamonds. Now you drop those cards, the cards you riffled off onto it, boom, like this. And now it goes six from top from this, then you just keep dropping those packets, but keep in a break like this into your hand, and then a pass or a cut would be made so you can control that card uh, where you need it to be. Whoops, not that one, that one. 
Now the action of dropping cards or springing cards into your hand or onto the table wasn't always called a dribble. In my opinion, uh, the term dribble is a fairly recent term because the earliest mention of this word dribble that I could find in print is by Ed Marlowe in his book Miracle Card Changes published in 1954. So the dribble double, uh, being described by Ed Marlowe, is getting a break, you know, get your break under two cards like this, transfer the deck to your, uh, to your, to this hand in an end grip, uh, transferring it to a thumb break now. So you have a break uh, under two cards on, the, on top of the deck, and uh, you would just dribble the cards onto the table and hold back the last two, right, as one card. For all we know, it could have been Bruce or Servan who came up with the idea of using a thumb break to force a card from a dribble. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is because in 1971, a magazine called Magic, now called The Complete Magic, um, in issue 11 of that transcript or magazine, um, Bruce Servan describes a trick that he calls a Zabracoon's to Triumph. In that routine, he describes a sort of dribble force with a thumb break to force a certain number of cards. So what Servan would do is he would need to force 10 cards on somebody. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. He would need to give somebody 10 cards, but make it seem like it was their choice, right? He would force 10 cards on them. And the way he would do that is describing uh, a dribble fourth, right? He would say, get a break with your thumb at the back, uh, you know, under the 10 cards to be forced, and dribble them onto the table and have somebody say stop. Once they do, you just give them the 10 cards. And that is, uh, that's the dribble force found in that book to force a number of cards. That trick was later republished in Servan's book called The Servan File, published in 1988, which is actually a great book and it's a fantastic trick. You should absolutely check it out. So here's where it gets a little confusing, all right? So in 1984, so a few years after all of this, um, a magazine uh, by Ed Marlowe was published called Marlowe Magazine, Volume 5. In that magazine, there is something called the Dribble Free Force. And uh, in this technique, it's a way in which you can have three people select cards from a dribble and have them all be controlled to the same spot in the deck, whether they be in the middle together, on top or the bottom in the middle, whatever you want to do. But the technique is, of course, using the dribble force that we know today as holding the break at the back and dribbling until somebody says stop and stopping there. But this is the confusing part. Because before he gets into that uh, technique, that card control technique, he says this in the book, and keep in mind this is 1984, he says, In the usual dribble force, a break is held by the right thumb at the inner end either above or below the card to be forced. Right hand dribbles the cards into the palm of the left hand as you request a spectator call out stop. The dribble is timed to arrive at the break when stop is called, thus forcing the card. So he's describing the dribble force, the one that we all use, but the way he words this, he says, in the usual dribble force. What does that even mean? Does he mean that uh, this is the first time that it's being mentioned? Or does he mean that it's a, already a well-known, est established thing? I have no idea. So it could be Servan, could be Marlowe, or could be John Carney. Not to be confused with John Kerry. So in 1987, the year I was born, uh, John Carney puts out a set of lecture notes in which he describes uh, the dribble force, uh, the same one that we've been talking about with the thumb break at the back. Somebody says stop, boom, there it is. Uh, John Carney put that out in 1987. He also goes into detail and in depth of this move in his book, uh, Carnicopia, and also he has a title, The Dribble Force, in his book, The Book of Secrets. Now, in the Book of Secrets, as he's explaining and talking about the Dribble Force, he says that he came up with this idea when he was a teenager, and John Carney, as a teenager, was probably around the mid-70s. 
John says that he was never able to find uh, this particular technique of the dribble force in print before, uh, but he says it se just seemed like a natural progression of the riffle force. So after uh, the John Carney stuff, um, I think the place that we all sourced it from and learned it from and sort of, uh, and sort of started flying with the dribble force is from Card College Volume 4 under the title, The Dribble Force. Now, Giobi, Roberto Giobi, is usually very, very good and thorough at crediting everything, every move, every subtlety, every every little thing uh, he credits. But for this, The Dribble Force, <laughs> there's absolutely no crediting, no names whatsoever. It's just a little paragraph describing uh, The Dribble Force. So to wrap things up, you know, it's hard to say uh, who invented the dribble force or where it came from, but if you take a look at all of Ed Marlowe's material as a whole, you'll notice that he uses the dribble a lot uh, for various deceptions. So if I had to put my money on it, I'd say that it was probably Ed Marlowe who came up with the idea using the dribble force with the thumb break at the back and stopping at that thumb break. Um, it's just hard to say uh, because it was never officially put in print as a dribble force by itself. But it had to have been around the same time that John Carney independently created the dribble force. Now, we've been talking about different techniques and ways in which you can uh, use the dribble force and, and uh, do it. But, you know, it's not an easy move. It does take a lot of practice to get it uh, smoothly and making it look deceptive and believable and without fumbling uh, cards as you're doing it because let's be honest, a dribble looks like a messy thing and an uncontrollable thing, so adding uh, control to this procedure is not easy. So through the years of playing with this move and practicing this, I've come up with a few uh, subtle, subtle things and little nuances to make it a little bit easier. So now I'd like to share with you uh, my touches on uh, this ancient uh, thing. Okay, so normally when a dribble force is being described in these books that we've been talking about, you would uh, cut the deck or get a break somehow in the middle and keep a thumb break there. Now, I hate when that happens, whether it be a dribble force or a classic force or even a riffle force. Anytime you need to get a break above or below a card uh, to force it, uh, people just go right into it. Okay, now pick one. All right, so let me cut the deck. Now say stop and take that card. It's kind of obvious what's going on there. So a good way to hide this and disguise it is use a jog shuffle. I always use a jog shuffle anytime I need to get a break to force a card. And what you want to do for a dribble force is do the jog shuffle. So for the dribble force, I like to have a bunch of cards to dribble. So when I do my jog shuffle, I chop off about a quarter to a third of the deck from the bottom, right? Like this. Like, and I just jog one card on top of that top card to be forced, like this, and shuffle off. That way, I can just continue and talk, uh, maintaining that jog at the back. And when I come time to need to force the card, I have that jog for me. And, you know, it's just a time delay thing. And it just saves having to make it obvious by cutting the deck first. But of course, you don't want to do with this and make it be noticed. Uh, to hide that, it's always best to tilt your hands up like this slightly, necktie your hands like this, and then do it that way the end jog is invisible. Now, most of the time, whenever a dribble force is being described in books, it simply just says, establish a thumb break at the back, right? So it hardly ever, I've, at least I've never really seen it, where it says to, um, where to put your thumb at the back, right? Are you saying put it in the middle? Are you saying put it all the way to the left or to the right? Where am I supposed to put my thumb? All it says is get a thumb break at the back, uh, but where, right? So where are you supposed to place that thumb? Well, if you take a look at a dribble, I think the best way to dribble cards is actually from the very corner of the deck, like this. You get a nice, good springing action, and the cards seem to, at least they feel like they're going one by one, and that's a very nice, flowy, consistent dribble doing it from just the corner of the deck. You know, not on the back, not anywhere else, not in the middle, but 
put your thumb, the pad of your thumb right here on the corner of the deck and that will produce a very nice uh, looking dribble. I want to address a common problem with the dribble force. Sometimes you just miss it, right? Uh, because it's so, uh, you can't really predict what's going to happen with uh, the thumb break because you're like this and you don't know where you're supposed to hold your break. So if you just do this, sometimes you can accidentally pop off a card or two more or not enough, right? Uh, sometimes you can totally miss the break altogether and your force will be soiled. So here's my solution to that. So like we talked about, chop off about a quarter, maybe more, a th maybe a third of the deck from the bottom, uh, establish your jog in the back, of course doing this neck tying so they can't see that jog, and then shuffling off. Now as you're talking blah blah blah, that's when you uh, come back and you want to get your break, and don't get it by pushing up, you want to always get your break from a jog by taking the lower part of the deck down right so nothing is suspicious or seen there it makes a you know little tiny things like that i i think i do i think do make a difference now here's the thumb placement that i find is most effective for the dribble force what you want to do let's come over and ask, like i said get your break now when you do this what you want to do is angle the upper packet slightly uh clockwise for me it's counterclockwise because i'm left-handed but for you it'll be clockwise okay so take your third finger so your ring finger there and you want to just push it a little bit against the base of your thumb there so it's kind of being angled there as you can see right it's being angled at very so slightly there and the reason for this is so you have a lip or a stop point that will never fail during this dribble force here's what i mean and from the front, of course, nobody can see a thing. Uh, these fingers completely cover everything, right? So now I have my break, and I'm tr and I'm doing the little squeeze move with my ring finger against the base of my thumb there. But from the front, these fingers shade everything. Nobody's ever going to see that. It just seems, looks like you're squaring the deck or whatever. But uh, now you have your little angle there. All right. So here's the action. Like I said, the best place to dribble cards is from the corner. So that's exactly where you put the pad of your thumb here right at the tip not not the very tip but right there uh on the corner of the deck and you will press down with your curled index finger on top and then just start dribbling the cards now because of your thumb being on the corner and this pack upper packet being angle jogged no cards will ever escape from this upper packet because of that angle uh the, the way it's positioned it, it's going to be right in the middle of your thumb there so there's no way cards will cards will dribble off of that there's no way you can make a mistake it's just they're going to be locked there so here's an exposed view of what might happen during this dribble force for somebody all right so what you want to do is of course get your break do the pushing move and then get in position with your thumb at the corner and then have somebody say stop as you drop cards and by the way for the dribble force never call it a dribble just say as i drop cards like this say stop anytime right always refer to as dropping cards never dribbling cards that just sounds weird for layman and dropping cards it makes it more sense and it makes you seem like a normal person <laughs> all right so so here's the action okay so you've gotten your break from the back with your thumb you've done the pushing move so it's now angled now you start dribbling cards and when they say stop you simply sort of do with this, just, that's all it is really, it's just bending your thumb up like this to drop all the cards below the break, right? So this upper pack is just going to be squeezed right here and so they won't go anywhere. And it's a very easy thing to do. It's a little bit knacky, but I think with enough practice, uh, you'll nail it every time, all right? So they say stop, stop right there. All you're gonna do is squeeze this upper packet very tightly and drop the lower ones. That's all you do, right? So the dribble for is say stop right there, boom, you got the card every time. All right, so with this angled upper packet, it's sort of a no fail protocol of the dribble force. So here's the whole thing in full speed so you can get a clear view and uh, what it's supposed to look like in a performance, okay? So in this case, we'll force the top card, the ace of spades, all right? So here's the performance of the dribble for us. Um, uh, for this next one, I want you to get just a random card in the deck. Uh, we'll do it a different way, just so it's completely random, all right? Uh, as I drop cards, just say stop anytime right there. All right, take that card, I won't look. And then uh, that's it, that's the dribble force. Always be aware, of course, of people around you 
and your angles of, of this brick, all right? So it's slightly turned for me clockwise, but for you counterclockwise, you just want, you want to hide that, right? You don't want anybody to see that. And so this hand shielding the deck pretty much, they can't even see the deck, will cover everything, okay? So once again, we'll force the five of diamonds. We have our break. Uh, do me a favor, say stop anytime right here. Take that card, I won't look, take a look at it. Boom, they got the five of diamonds. All right, guys, so as always, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. If you enjoyed this deep dive, um, in Dribble Force video, and you want to see more deep dives like this, please let me know in the comments. And uh, if you learned something new, uh, hit the like button and sub to the channel. Until next time, happy practicing. I love you guys.